Since the beginning of time, God has been pursuing mankind. His pursuit is steadfast and unwavering. His love is resolute and unmatched. From the moment of our first breath, we have all been searching for hope. In every human heart, there is a longing for true purpose and meaning. There is a sense that we were meant for more. Our city is filled with people searching for truth, searching for answers. These answers can't be found in quick fixes, self-help books, or our limited ability to understand the meaning of life. Eternity is within us. The kingdom of God isn't a place, it's a people who are pursued by their creator and are found in the midst of their searching. You see, where the pursuit of God and the searching of mankind collide, there is Jesus. The bridge to the one true God, Jesus. The beginning and the end, Jesus. The perfect example of perfect love, Jesus. The one who loves us in spite of our failures, takes our worst and gives us his best, Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life, the one who broke the chains of our sin, the one who has the power to heal and restore, the one who defeated death and rose victorious on the third day, Jesus. No other name is higher, no other name is greater, no other name than the one we celebrate today, Jesus. Welcome in, guys. Welcome in. This is the fourth lesson in this series. Are Christians still sinners saved by grace? Are Christians still sinners saved by grace? And in lesson one, we open with a statement that's very popular in the church today, which is, I am a sinner saved by grace. And in the first three lessons, we looked at scripture that identified the biblically accurate description of who we are as sons and daughters of God. And the better way for a Christian to state this is I was a sinner who was saved by grace. Now I'm a righteous, blameless, holy child of God. Amen. Now I'm a righteous, blameless, holy child of God. In the last lesson, we identified what we see as the lack of sound biblical knowledge and understanding by the body of Christ concerning the truth that all of us have a spirit with a soul that is housed in a body. And by all us, we mean those who have Jesus on the inside of them and those who do not have Jesus on the inside of them. You see, everyone who is born into this world is born a triune being. All of us have a spirit. All of us have a soul. All of us have a body. And this is a critical, this is very critical to understanding why Christians may occasionally commit sin. And while others choose to commit sin more often. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we've seen a reference for our triune existence in Paul's prayer for the church at Thessalonica. Where he said, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And also in the last lesson, we also looked at Genesis 2-7, which says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life and man became a living being. Amen. What God breathed into man was his essence, who he is, a spirit. And we've seen this in John chapter 4, verse 24, where it says God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we also see in Genesis 2, 7, that when God breathed his spirit into the dust of the ground, man became a living being. The King James Version says that they became a living soul. So in this lesson tonight, we we saw we we already saw that the soul is not the same as the spirit. While the soul makes you who you are, it makes you different from any other soul. The spirit is what gives the body life. And we see this eloquently stated in James 2.26, where he says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So we closed the last lesson with a brief look at the body and learned that it drives our emotions, our passions, and desires through what it sees, hears, and feels. And we seen this in Galatians 5, 16, and 17, where it says, Walk in the Spirit, and you not, shall not fulfill the lust or the desire of the flesh. For the flesh lust against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. 
I want you to turn to that. I want you to go to Galatians 5, 16 and 17. I want you to look at this because it's very important that you see what I'm fixing to tell you. Because if you look closely at what is recorded at the end of verse 17, it tells us something of importance here. At the end of verse 17, it tells us of something of importance here. And if we don't catch this, we're going to miss the whole concept. And it tells us that our spirit wars against our flesh and vice versa. Why is this war happening? Why is this war happening that Paul is telling us that our spirit wars against our flesh and vice versa? You see, the flesh is trying to do something it shouldn't be doing. And the spirit is fighting against it to stop it. Likewise, because the spirit is trying to do something that the flesh does not enjoy, the flesh is warring against it to get its way. This is why Christians sometimes sin, because the flesh overcomes the spirit, and they begin to act out on the flesh rather than walking in the spirit. Amen? The flesh has won the battle. But this, my friend, should be the exception and not the rule. In the first three lessons, we provided the foundation for what we're going to cover in this lesson and then the next two lessons. So again, I'm going to ask the question, why do most Christians believe that they are sinners saved by grace? Why do most Christians believe that they are sinners saved by grace? But an even more important question is this one. What, they, what have they seen in Scripture that appears to support this belief? If I was to ask you tonight, if you believe that you're a sinner saved by grace, what Scripture shows this type of belief to you? Because as I said earlier, one of the reasons for this belief is how the body of Christ has been taught to read Romans chapter 7. And most believe the chapter is describing a born-again person who is still struggling with a sin nature. Hence the phrase, a sinner saved by grace. But is that the truth that we see in Romans chapter 7? Is that truly the truth that we see in Romans chapter 7? Because there's very, very few Christians who model the behavior of the believers in Berea as seen in Acts 17, 11, which states these were more fair minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. If we are to truly understand what is being taught in Romans chapter seven, we have to keep the chapter in the context of the entire book of Romans and we have to pay particular attention to chapter six and eight. This is the only way the truth in Romans chapter 7 will be clearly captured and understood. Throughout this study, we have come back to this common belief most Christians believe, and they believe that they still have a sin nature because they find themselves committing sin. If words mean anything, who in here believes that words matter? Who in here believes that words have power? Who in here believes that spoken words can be spoken into existence? Because if words mean anything, then what the Bible says disagrees with this belief. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Did you, do you know what the word new means? The word new means something that has never existed before. The sin nature we had before we were born again no longer lives inside of us. It's not there. Paul drives it home this point with the words passed away. When a person passes away, we know that person is no longer alive. 
the person ceases to exist in this world except in our hearts and our minds. This is what the Greek communicates about sin as it relates to our born-again spirits. The born-again experience affects our spirit, but it does not affect our minds. This is very, very important to understand and why we are told to renew our minds in Romans 12, 1 and 2, and to live by our new man in Romans 13, verse 14, and Ephesians 4, 24, and Colossians 3, 10. But I don't want you just to take my word for it. I want you to open your Bibles because we're going to look at these scriptures now and we're going to see exactly what the Bible says because there's many people out here teaching wrong doctrine. There's many people out here teaching wrong theological understanding. There's people out here teaching in correctly and they're claiming to be something that they're really not because they want a title over their name flip with me to romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 2 and we're going to look at this because when paul appealed to the church at rome to renew its minds in romans 12 the apostle paul also begged them to do it he wrote this he said i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In the same way that Paul appealed and begged the church in Rome to renew its mind, he's doing the same with us today. Would you guys say that this, the word of God is a living word of God and it's still active today? That this appeal wasn't just for the Romans, but this appeal was for us today. Because these verses paint an image of Paul on his knees with his hands clasped in front of him tears flowing down his face, appealing and begging us to do the same. In the books of Romans, Ephesians, and Colossians, Paul, he instructs the Christians in Rome, Ephesus, and Coloss to live by their new nature, their born-again spirits. And Paul writes the following in Romans 13, 14. He says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Does anybody know what the word provision means? Because it's very important. Remember, we just said that words matter and words have power. So what does the word provision mean? I'm going to tell you right now, the word provision means to know ahead. To know ahead. The verse says, make no provision for the flesh. In other words, you have predetermined that the flesh will not influence you to sin because you are living by who you have become in Jesus Christ. Paul's saying here that you have already predetermined that your body, that your body will not influence you to sin. Because you are living by who you have become in Jesus Christ. That's powerful. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24, Paul wrote this. He said, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And finally, in Colossians 3.10, we read the following. It says, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Remember, we lost the image of God, right? We lost the image of God when Adam partook of the fruit. Because if you go on in Genesis, you're going to see that Adam begot a son in his own likeness. So, Adam begot a son in his likeness. The likeness of God was lost. That communion was lost. But because of Jesus' sacrifice, because we can become new creations, new creatures in Christ, we can now put on the identity that God had originally created and given to Adam and Eve. That's something to shout about. That's what Colossians 3.10 is saying. 
that and have put on the new man who is renewed a knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Right now we are back in the image of God because we're born again. Amen. But before we move on, I want you to see the common thread that binds these verses. Because we have to choose to keep our thoughts and our emotions and our bodies in check and follow our born again spirits that we receive from Jesus. It's a decision that we make beforehand. We go into every situation knowing how we are going to respond. You see, spiritually, we're just like Jesus. We just put this in print. You don't need to clean your glasses. And we know that Jesus did not sin even though he could have chosen to do so. Remember, when Jesus was on earth, he was a man who could be and was tempted, as we see in Hebrews 4.15. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So why do we sin? Why do we sin? Bear with me, because I'm going to answer that question clearly and thoroughly when we take a somewhat detailed look at Romans chapter 6. But for now, leading up to chapter 6, let's see the context of chapter 7. One of the most misunderstood and wrongly taught chapters in the entire Bible. And I see it taught wrong here on TikTok, left and right. Because it's used to teach that Christians have a sin nature, which is not true. So what's the problem? Romans 7 is taught separately from chapters 1 through chapter 6 and chapter 8. If we want to truly understand what chapter 7 is teaching us, then we cannot separate it from the chapters before it and the chapters that follow. you got to read it in context. Romans chapter 7 can only be understood when we consider what we read in chapters 1 through 6, and there's a catch. We have to accept and believe what we read in those chapters. If you can't accept and believe Romans 1 through 6, then you'll never accept and believe Romans chapter 7, and you'll always take it out of context. From this point on, we're going to briefly highlight that we've seen in the first five chapters of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1. You guys ready? I'm going to show you what we see throughout Romans 1 through 6. You ready? Let's do this. In Romans chapter 1, Paul contrasts what it means to live by faith and what it means to live by the law. Put another way, what it means to live by the born-again spirit that is on the inside of us and what it means to live by the old sin nature that is no longer inside of us. For example, in the latter part of verse 17, Paul writes, they just shall live by faith, Romans 1.17. The implication's clear. A person cannot earn justification through performing the works of the law. And Paul is quoting from the Old Testament now, Habakkuk 2.4, where he says, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So the phrase, right, the phrase, the just shall live by faith, is repeated three additional times in the New Testament. Galatians 2.20, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38. And you're probably thinking right now, well, pastor... Why is this so critical for Christians to understand? You see, the person who confesses Jesus as Lord is the only one who is just in God's sight and can live by faith. Did you know that these would be fighting words for the Jews because the law, not faith, is what they believe separated them from everyone else? We see in this very first chapter that Paul has planted his feet squarely on the side of faith. His insistence on faith rather than the works of the law is the red thread that is seen throughout this entire epistle. A key point to remember from Romans 1 is a person cannot live by faith and live by the law at the same time. It's impossible. Does everybody understand the concept of Romans chapter 1? Romans chapter 2. Let's move on. Paul continues his, his examination of what it means to live by faith rather than by the works 
of the law in this chapter. Look what he says in verses 13 and 15, Romans chapter 2, verses 13 and 15. He says, For not the hearts of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts are cursing or else excusing them. Speaking to the Jews here, Paul says the Gentiles whom you consider dogs are doing by nature what you're trying to do by works. Oh, wow. Do you guys ever catch that? Paul's telling them the Gentiles whom you consider dogs are doing by nature what you're trying to do by works. The apostle in verse 13, he states a very general principle that the doers of the law can only be justified if justification is attempted by the law. Then in this verse, in the next one, he proceeds to show that the same principle is applicable to the pagans, the Gentiles. Even though they do not have the written law of God yet they have sufficient knowledge of his will to take away every excuse for sin. And consequently, for this reason, he reaches the conclusion that they were guilty. Paul said they did by nature those things that were contained in the law. This means that while they did not have the revealed will of God told to them, some of the things required by the law, and you understand the law is his will, Right. The law is his will that they did this by nature. For example, they had respect for parents. They told the truth. They 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 had justice. They had honesty. They had chastity. So as far as they did any of those things, they showed that they had a law on the inside of themselves. And wherein they failed in these things, they showed that they were justly condemned. Paul said in that day. In that day, they did these things. They were a law unto themselves. It means this. It means that their own reason and conscience constituted in these things a law or a prescribed that for them, which the revealed law did to the Jews. They didn't need the law to tell them what's right and what's wrong. And then he drives home the point in verse 29 when he says, but he is a Jew who is inwardly and circumcision that is of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. There's a key point to remember from Romans 2, that only a human spirit that has the life of God within it can live by faith. Are you guys understanding this? That you can't live by faith until you come to Christ and receive his gift of salvation and he's residing inside of you. Chapter 3. I know I'm going through this really fast, but there's a lot of chapters we got to cover here. Chapter 3. This chapter doesn't get any easier for the Jews who insist on holding on to the law. And as a result, they reject the gospel of Christ. And Paul opens chapter 3 with a question pertaining to whether there was an advantage to being a Jew. And he asks this. He says, are Jews better than Gentiles? Or rather, have they an advantage as to character and prospects of going to heaven over the Gentiles? The question only refers to the great point in the debate about being just before God. In verse 2, he admitted that the Jews had important advantages In some respects, but he now affirms that those advantages did not make a difference between them and the Gentiles in terms of justification. So he tells them that the Jews have no preference or advantage over the Gentiles in regard to the subject of justification before God. In fact, Paul went a step further and he tells them that they have failed to keep the law. They are sinners. And if they are justified, it must be in the same way as the rest of the world. But look at what Romans 3, 19 through 21 says. It says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Did you guys know 
that Jewish males are raised to believe that keeping the Mosaic law is what gives them the right standing before God. To this day, that Jewish males are raised to believe that keeping the Mosaic law is what gives them right standing before God. But in three verses, Paul dismantled this whole theology. In three verses, 19 through 21. Because Paul says that even the law itself testifies to a time when people will not need to, to be justified. And just to make sure the reader doesn't miss the key point of this chapter, he writes in verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Paul made it clear that no righteousness of their own by the following of the law will be the grounds of their justification. That they are sinners and as such can have no claim to be treated as righteous solely based on their following the law. God has devised a plan by which they may be pardoned and saved and that is by faith and faith alone. So in the first three chapters of Romans... Paul repeatedly confronts the Jews with the truth that dependence on the works of the law to earn justification or the righteousness is futile. It's only through the simple act of faith in the gospel of Jesus that men and women can enter the Father's throne room of grace. A key point to remember from Romans 3, a person cannot be justified by keeping the law. A person can only be justified by faith. Amen. So if you have your Bible open right there in Romans 3, these key points, you should be writing them because that's what the chapter is about. That a person cannot be justified by keeping the law. A person can only be justified by faith. Sorry, Torah observer. Sorry, Hebrew Israelites. Sorry, but your, your justification and your righteousness comes through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone through the faith that you have in him. Romans chapter 4, Paul brings out the big guns here in chapter 4. He, he brings up Abraham. The Jews boast about being Abraham's offspring in John chapter 8, verses 31 through 59. While the passage is a little too long to include tonight, I want to highlight verses 31 through 36 of that. So John 8, 31 through 36, it says this. It says, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most surely I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. I want you guys to underline that in your Bible. Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus made it very clear that the one who commits sin is a slave to sin, and only those who accept him can be free from it. Amen? The only way you can be free from sin is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You see, the Jews' relationship with Abraham did not free him. Or justify them. As a matter of fact, it caused them more condemnation because they did not walk as Abraham did. Jesus tried to teach them this truth because the Jews put unwavering and unapologetic confidence into two things being the seed of Abraham, including having his covenant and the law of Moses. And now here comes Paul, who says there is, a, there is a difference between living as Abraham lived, which they didn't attempt to do, and living under the law, which they were failing miserably at. Because we read in, in, in following in Romans 4, 2-3, it says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he has something to boast about. But not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. You see, the Jews recognized Abraham's special standing with God and, and believed he had it because of what he had done. Abraham's special standing was not based on what he had done, but on who he had believed. 
I think if more people could understand this, we'd all be in one accord. It wasn't about what Abraham did. It was about who he believed. And Paul emphasizes this by using the words counted, reckoned, and imputed throughout the chapter. Now we want to see how Paul talks about faith and the laws that's related to Abraham receiving God's promise to him. And I want you to look at verse 13 and 14 because it says this. It says, for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. You hear so many people say, well, I'm, I, I'm a follower of Abraham and I have this promise because I am the seed of Abraham. I'm a Hebrew Israelite. But watch this. Paul destroys it. Paul says, for if they which are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is made no effect. If you think that you're, you get something just because you're an heir of Abraham, that promise is void. These two verses show us that the promise God made to Abraham had, Abraham had nothing whatsoever to do with the law, but it had everything to do with his faith. Here's the harsh truth and reality that we read in these verses. If a person is of the law, that person is not born again and is not part of God's promise to Abraham. Let's read it again. I want you guys to understand this. Verse 13. For the promises that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. If a person is of the law, that person is not born again, is not a part of God's promise to Abraham. That person is not going to heaven. Abraham's life, Paul says, is one that was lived by faith in God's word and in the promise God had made to him. And what he received was not earned through works, but through the righteousness of faith. And he simply believed that God would keep his word. Isn't that something? How many of us today can stand around and say, I'm just waiting on God's word to come to pass. I know what God gave me. I know the promises he told me. But I'm going to stand here and I'm going to keep serving him. I'm going to keep glorifying him. I'm going to keep praising him until the word comes to pass. Until God's word comes to pass. Until his promise comes to pass. I think Abraham is somebody that we can look at because Abraham simply believed that God would keep his word. Abraham simply believed that what God said he would do, he would do. So a key point to remember from Romans 4, right, this above Romans 4, is faith is believing and trusting God, knowing that he will keep his word. How many of you in here can stand on that, that God's going to keep his word, amen? How many of you know that God's going to keep his word? Now let's all move on to chapter 5. Let's look at chapter 5, Romans chapter 5. I hope you guys are following along in your Bible because this is very important. So here Paul, now in Romans chapter 5, he says, now that he has shown the Jews that Abraham's righteousness was imputed to him through unwavering faith in what God had spoken and not through works of the law, Paul's going to give you and emphasize this point in the first two verses of the chapter. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, just like Abraham, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What Paul is saying is nothing short of astounding to the Jewish mind. He's saying we are justified through our faith in Jesus Christ and nothing else. And this same faith is the reason why we are no longer at war with God. We now live in peace with him. But if you have rejected Jesus, you are still his enemy. You think you're living in harmony with God because you perform the works of the law? 
but you are no more in harmony with God than the Gentiles. In verse 10, Paul says, Jesus reconciled us to God through his death. The law could not then and cannot now perform this reconciliation. But pay very close attention to what Paul says in verse 11. He says it is through our faith in the completed works of Jesus that through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Paul doesn't say a reconciliation, but the reconciliation. Ladies and gentlemen, only Jesus can reconcile us to God. The law cannot reconcile you to God. Your works cannot reconcile you to God. Your good deeds cannot reconcile you to God. The only thing, the only way, the only thing that can be the reconciliation to God is Jesus. And Jesus has finished work on that cross. Somebody needs to give him praise. Because it's through Jesus that we have the reconciliation. Paul's showing you here in chapter 5. He's showing you how every man, every woman and child has been condemned. Sentenced to a spiritual death. Because of Adam's rebellion, man is not a sinner because he sins. Man is a sinner because of the death nature operating in him. And that is what causes him to sin. In the same way man became a sinner through Adam's spiritual death, man can also be made righteous through Jesus' spiritual death and resurrection. Thank God tonight. Thank the Father that he sent the Son to be crucified so that we had reconciliation back with the Father. So we've learned in the first five chapters of the letters to the Christians in Rome. In chapter one, we learned that living by faith and not by works of the law is the red thread that runs throughout the entire book of Romans. In Romans two, we've learned the only way to live by faith is to have God's life operating inside of us. And when we have God's life, we have the capacity to live according to the righteousness of the law. In chapter 3, we learn that the law itself testified of a time when it would no longer be needed. In chapter 4, we learn that Abraham's life was based on faith, simply believing God would do what he promised. And in Romans chapter 5, we're justified in God's sight because of our faith in Jesus Christ. So now that we're born again and have God's life and nature, why do we sin? And we can find that out in Romans chapter 6. And all this is necessary foundation before we can turn our attention to Romans chapter 7. And here's something I would like for you to consider. When you finish listening to or reading this Bible and the ones to follow, read the book of Romans. Give the Holy Spirit, the teacher, an opportunity to minister to you. As you read, don't be surprised. If he pulls back the curtains on truth that in the past you have misunderstood, and yes, I'm speaking from experience because God will pull back the curtains and he will strip those things that you thought was truth and they won't, they'll, they'll, it'll totally be destroyed because what you believe wasn't truth and he's going to begin to show you that. But you have to be open. You have to be open to what God is going to show you. Amen. You have to want to receive it. You have to want to receive it because if you don't want to receive it, you're not going to accept it. And if you don't accept it, you're not going to grow in wisdom and you're not going to grow in knowledge. Amen. So why do Christians, why do Christians commit sin? Why do they commit sin? It's very important that we understand this. Why is it that Christians commit sin? We're going to go back to Romans chapter 5 and start in verse 12. And we're going to look at 12 through 19. 
It says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We are born into this world as sinners. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's not any one of our faults. Point your finger at Adam. Because the moment he ate of the forbidden tree, he corrupted the human spirit and condemned every person, every person ever born into this world to an eternity separated from God. And here is the truth that we have to understand. Committing sin is not what makes us sinners. I'm going to repeat that. Committing sin is not what makes us sinners. We sin because we're born with a nature, a spirit that wants to sin. We sin because that is who we were before we accept Jesus as our Savior and are transformed. We were born with a sin nature. Sin was our default setting, and that was normal for us. But when we got saved, our spirits were transformed, but our mind and our flesh were not. This is why Paul says that the spirit is battling with the flesh and the flesh is battling with the spirit because they're constantly fighting. Our minds and our flesh must be taught and forced to yield to our renewed spirits. And that is the work that is being done within each and every one of us. It's getting our minds and flesh in agreement with our new spirit. Look at verse 19. It says, For as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, Jesus Christ, shall many be made righteous. With our first birth, we received a sin nature, a corrupted human spirit. When we're born again, our second birth, we receive a spotless and sin-free human spirit. We no longer have sin living inside of us, praise God. Amen. The old you has died, passed away. The new you is born. That new spirit is born. We no longer have sin living inside of us, but we must say yes to Jesus. Because if we don't, we're headed for the lake of fire and eternal separation from God because sin still rules. It still exercises its authority over us. Look at verse 20, it says, And moreover the law entered, that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Many people read verse 21 and believe that it's saying that the more a person sins, the more grace that will be available to you. Has anybody ever heard somebody teach that? Because I have. I've heard pastors in the pulpit say, the more you sin, the more grace God's going to give. You can't out sin God's grace. I've heard pastors preach that you can't out sin God's grace. If we read verse 21 and we, and, 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 and I mean really, really read verse 21, we will see that Paul is talking about it's not the act of sin, but the sin nature from which the acts of sin originate. Do you see the words reigned and reign? Is everybody, you guys got your Bibles open, right? You're in a Bible study. You're in a lesson here. I hope you have your Bibles open. Do you guys see the words reigned and reign? Reigned and reign. They mean to rule or to govern, to act as a king. We can read verse 21 this way and maintain its scriptural integrity. You guys ready? In the past, the sin nature was king in your life. It decided what you would do and what you would not do. It also condemned you to an eternity in the lake of fire. But now you can receive God's grace through a new sinless nature, a nature that is just like God's nature. And if you will allow that nature to lead and guide you in how you live, then an eternity with Jesus Christ awaits you. 
Do you guys understand that? So the word reigned and reign means to rule or to govern or to act as a king. One more point about grace before we move on. As, as I said earlier, many people believe that grace is what we must use to cover our sins. I'm going to sprinkle a little grace here, and I'm going to sprinkle a little over there. And whenever we sin, I'm going to sprinkle a little bit more grace. And, and But that is not what grace does in the life of a Christian. If you think that you can cover your sin with grace, you are sadly, sadly mistaken. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But it's important for us to know that grace empowers us not to sin versus covering up our sin after we commit it. Grace isn't there to cover your sin. Grace is there to keep you from sinning. Do you guys understand that? Grace does not cover your sin. Grace keeps you from sinning. Well, where are you getting that from, Pastor Nate? I've never read that in Scripture. My pastor's never taught me that. I've never heard anyone t tell me that. Well, look at Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12. Let's look at that. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Well, I don't understand what it's saying, Pastor Nate. I don't understand what it's saying. Let me read it out of the Amplified Bible for you. It says this, For the remarkable un undeserved grace of God that brings us salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to reject ungodliness and worldly and moral desires and to live sensible, upright, and godly lives. Lives with a purpose that reflects spiritual maturity in this present age. Grace isn't meant to cover your sin. Grace is meant to keep you away from sin. The grace of God can bring salvation to all. But we know that all people will not accept it. God has offered salvation to everyone, but it's up to the individual to accept his offer or reject his offer. For the person who says yes, then grace begins to do something. Paul says that the grace of God is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Paul wrote that grace teaches, which means he instru the grace instructs, trains, and disciplines us to deny, which that means reject in all forms ungodliness and worldly lust. Grace does not cover sins. It teaches us to reject it. Grace does not erase sin. It instructs us how not to do it in the first place. Are you guys catching this? Grace does not cover sin. It teaches us to reject it. Grace does not erase sin. It instructs us how to not do it in the first place. When we truly understand and recognize what grace has done and is doing in our lives, We will begin to reject the idea that we continue to be sinners who are saved by the same grace that is teaching us how not to sin. Does this make sense now? Now, with all of this in mind, let's look at Romans chapter 6 in some detail. You guys ready? I know you guys like it when I start breaking down chapters because it gives you a lot of clarity. So Romans chapter 6, verse 1, it says this. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Do you see what Paul is doing here? Do you see what Paul is doing here in verse 1? He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He's asking us to think about what we just read in Romans 5, 20 and 21. Do you see how Romans 6 is a continuation of Romans 5? It isn't a standalone book. In order to understand Romans 6, you have to understand Romans 1 through 5.
Paul's response to that is this. So you're telling me that committing sin is not a big deal because you still receive God's grace? Can't you just hear Paul's expression? Really? Seriously? You believe that? That, that? that sin is no big deal? That you still receive God's grace? Paul goes on in verse 2 and he says, Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Paul says, If you believe this, you need to lay off the camel milk. If a person is dead to sin, how can he commit sin? He can't. He's dead to sin. Spell it with me. D-E-A-D. How many of you know a person who has died? How many of you in here know a person that has died or passed away? You want truth? You want reality? Well, you're getting it tonight. How many of you know someone that's passed away? When was the last time that person called you or sent you an email or a friend request on Facebook? Come on. When was the last time that person called you or sent you an email or a friend on Facebook? They haven't. Why? Because they have died. They're no longer in existence just like the old you has died. And passed away. We have died once and for all to sin. Can we breathe its air again? The answer is no. We cannot. And until. Until we submit our minds and thoughts to our new nature. We will think like the old dead nature. When a person dies. That person ceases to function. And no longer exists. Except in our hearts and our minds. As I said previously, the born-again experience does not affect our minds and thoughts. Something that we, I have emphasized throughout these lessons is that we have to change our thoughts on purpose to agree with our new nature. This is why it's emphasized through the Bible that we have to renew our minds. We have to get our minds out of the world and our minds back on spiritual and righteous things. Our old nature is dead and new nature is born. Verses 3 and 4 says this. It says, or do you not know? Now, a lot of you guys know me personally. I ask you, do you not know that as many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism, baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Do you see the word should there? Do you see the word should? Do you know what that word should emphasizes? That word should there emphasizes that you have a choice. You have a choice to walk in your new life or you have a choice to walk in your old life. You have a choice. A person who is not born again cannot make such a choice because of the influence that Satan exerts over the sin nature. Remember, it's only the power of Jesus Christ that resides within us that enables us to resist sin. James wrote, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It's only through our submission to God that we can resist the devil. And when we do resist, he flees. If the devil is not fleeing from us, it's because we're not doing a good enough job resisting him. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. I was tempted beyond my, my knowing. I was I, The devil made me do it. No, you're making up excuses because you don't want to humbly submit yourself before the Lord and resist the devil. You don't want to resist the devil because it brings pleasure to your flesh. It brings pleasure. And because our flesh is fallen, that's all we want is pleasure. Verse 
verses 5 through 7 says this. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. The body of sin that is done away with, this is the sin nature. The corrupted human spirit that is passed down to us from Adam, the King James Version, uses the word destroyed or annulled. When a marriage is annulled, our law says it never happened. It never existed. See, there's a difference between a divorce and an annulment. An annulment means that that marriage never took place. And that is what this word communicates about the corrupted human spirit. When it's destroyed, the Bible treats it as if it never existed. So why are you going back to something that never existed? Why are you returning to the vomit just as a dog does? Oh, pastor, you're being harsh. No, I'm not being harsh. I'm telling you the truth because so many people are pitter-pattering around and don't want to preach the truth of the Bible. This is the truth of the Bible. You're returning to your vomit just like a dog does when you go back to your sin nature. The word slave on the surface doesn't give us a warm and fuzzy feeling, does it? It's the Greek word doulos. In Hebrew, it's a bed. In biblical times, a servant was paid a wage and had the freedom to come and go as he pleased. Not so with a slave, a doulos. He subject himself willingly and on purpose to the will of his master. He chose to give up his freedom and he chose to not have a will of his own. A doulos is a person who is in a permanent relation of a servitude to another. His will altogether swallowed up in the will of the other. Who in here is a servant of God? Who has allowed God's will to rule their life and your will to be laid down, crucified, and put to sleep? People say, all the time. Well, God gave us a free will. And we're going to use that free will because God gave me that free will. I hear it all day long. Well, if God didn't give us a free will, then we'd be a robot, right? But let me show you something. Even Jesus succeeded to the Father's will. Even Jesus became a servant to the Father. Are you saying you're better than Jesus? Oh, it's uh, got a free will. God wants me to use that free will. In Matthew 26, 39, Jesus said this, and it's gonna, this, 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 this description sheds light on why Jesus says to the Father, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. When he's in Gethsemane, as well as what he declares about his relationship with the Father in John 5.30. And we're going to read that verse from the Amplified Version because I want you to understand it. I want you to understand it fully. He says, I am doing, I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my accord, but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders. Even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I am bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. And my judgment is right, meaning it's just and righteous, because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own own aim my own purpose but only the will and the pleasure of the father who sent me Do you guys understand this that even Jesus became a humble servant to the father that it wasn't his will that made the decision but it was the father's will you see before we were born again we were a doulos to the sin of na sin nature. Our human spirits were corrupted. And we were in a permanent relationship of servitude, of slavery. And we were in servitude to sin. 
We were powerless to change that relationship. But we needed a person with a pure, uncontaminated, life-giving spirit who was willing to purchase our freedom for us. Jesus willingly paid that price once and for all. Now we are in a permanent relationship of servitude, slavery to righteousness, to a just, to a righteous, to a loving God. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to pay the price and free me from the servitude of sin. And I am willing to be a servant of your righteousness, a servant of your glory, a servant of your mercy mercy I'm willing to be a slave to God I'm willing to be a slave to God it's not a demeaning or diminished position it's showing my loyalty it's showing my commitment it's showing my love for him I'm willing to be a servant for God The text reads, should no longer be slaves of sin. As we as I read here in the New King James. But see, most Bibles translate doulos as servant or bond servant. And you know why it does that? Because of the negative view that society has of the word slave and slavery. But the concept of slavery is essential to understanding how Jesus lived. And how we are to live as Christians. And we saw this in the Amplified Bible reading of John 530. And the truth Paul is speaking is astounding. But will be hard for many Christians to hear and accept. This is why people don't want to read the Bible. This is why people don't want biblical truth. Because they want that ear tickling, pat on the back, feel good message. They want somebody to make them feel better about their sin. Instead of showing them where they're wrong and in error. They want somebody to let make them feel better about their wrongdoings. Instead of showing them and directing them to the path of righteousness. They want somebody to feel bad for them. They want somebody to make them feel good about themselves let me tell you something tonight it's not about how you feel it's not about how others make you feel it's about being renewed and being the new creation in Jesus Christ and showing your servitude to the father who set you free give him some praise tonight because we have been freed from the servitude or slavery of the sin nature so that we can enter a new servitude, a new form of slavery, slaves to righteousness. We're no longer slaves to a corrupt human spirit. Now we are sons and daughters of God who willingly choose to be slaves to the will of our Heavenly Father through our new sinless human spirit. Thank you, Lord. I just thank you tonight, Father. Speak tonight, Father. Verses 8 through 11, let's read that together. It says, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word reckon here paints an image of a person reviewing a document like an official proceeding. Uh, text citations and monographs to make an informed decision. So after reading the last piece of evidence, the person concludes that yes, these are the facts in this matter and they will stand up in court and Paul stands up in court and he stands before the church of the Romans and he says, listen, listen to me. Based on what I have said up to this point, consider yourselves without question to be dead to the sin nature. Consider this to be dead to the corrupted human spirit. We're not sinners no more. We have a new life. We are alive with a new uncorrupted human spirit through Jesus Christ. 
Who is a new creation in here? Who can stand up and say, I'm a new creation in Christ? If we don't understand this truth, if we don't understand this truth, we're going to continue to yield to the sin that lives in our unglorified bodies instead of making our unglorified bodies yield to our new sinless human spirit. Remember, throughout this series, I've been telling you that we have to train our mind and our body to yield to the spirit that's inside of us. And because a person is born again with the life of Jesus inside of them, when it comes to the sin nature, that person has become a corpse. There's no sin inside that person to influence them. This is what Paul is trying to get us to understand. A person who is dead, if you touch him, will he flinch? No. Will he open his eyes? No. Will he respond to a lighted match? No. The person is a corpse. There is nothing left of them except of the body. Verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey in its lust. Do you see the word let in this verse? Pastor, we don't have choices in this life. Do you see the word let in this verse? It means that we can choose to not allow the sin that is in our bodies to determine how we live. This is the truth that we have also repeated throughout this lesson. When a person who has the life of Jesus living in them commits sin, it's because they have chosen to do so. Paul says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. He doesn't say reign in your spirit, just like the mind, the body does not get born again. That's why the Bible says we must mortify the deeds of the flesh. We are to put to death the actions and temptations that arise because of the sin that lives in our bodies. Turn to Romans 8, 13. Jump with me to Romans 8, verse 13. And it states this, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Now, jump over to Colossians 3, 5, and it says, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, go back to 13 in Romans. Go back to verse 13. It says, And do not present your members as instruments of un un unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of, of righteousness to God. I think it's interesting the wording that Paul uses in this verse. He said, do not present your members when it comes to sin. So when, we, when it comes to sin, we have to make ourselves av available to do it. You have to be available to sin. What would be an example of a person making himself available to sin? Maybe you decide to go to a bar, but only for a cherry cola. You've just made yourself available to sin. Not to mention you're ruining your Christian testimony. You may not drink alcohol the first time or the second time or maybe not even the third time. But if you keep going back to the bar, if you keep making yourself available to the alcohol, eventually you're going to have a drink. That is the image that Paul is communicating. Paul says, don't present yourself to sin. Don't put yourself in a place to be tempted by sin. I heard somebody tell me one time, well, this person went into a drug house and shared the gospel. And they went back to this drug house and they shared the gospel. And they went back to this drug house and they shared the gospel. All you're doing is opening yourself up. How many times can you go back to that drug house before you start using drugs? I'm going to tell you right now, I'd love to go into drug houses and help set addicts free because I am an ex-addict. But I know that if I step into a drug house, 
that the temptation to use is there. And every time I step into that house, the temptation gets stronger and it gets stronger and it gets stronger and it gets stronger. And eventually that sin is going to break me because my flesh is weak, but my spirit is strong. But remember, the spirit is battling not only the flesh, but the mind. There's two on one. And eventually and you might be strong in Christ. You might be walking in the spirit. You may be surrendered to God. But eventually, if you keep putting your in the situation, the sin will reign over you. You will crumble. So Paul says, do not put yourself in a place to be tempted to sin. Think about it this way. If you've ever attended a birthday party when all the guests are present and it's time for the cake, And everyone is seated, and the person of honor waits patiently for the cake to be brought out. And once the candles are lit, the cake is brought out and presented to the guest of honor so that the person can blow out the candle. Now think of the cake as your mortal body, and you're presenting it as an instrument of sin versus presenting it to God. It's about choice. Either we are presenting our bodies to God, or we are presenting it to sin. Are you guys with me? Are you understanding what Paul's talking about here? Verse 14. Verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. So what Paul's doing here is he's connecting the sin nature with the law. The law was given to people who had a sin nature, he says. Now that we have God's life, the law doesn't apply to us anymore. Uh Uh-oh. Sorry, Hebrew Israelites. Sorry. But Paul here is telling me now that we have God's life, the law doesn't apply to us anymore. We are free from the dominion of sin. We now live under a new law. And what is that new law? You're going to see it in Romans 8, verse 2. The law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. I'm not under your law. I'm under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Remember, being under grace means we're being taught how to resist, turn from and walk away from anything that is not of God. Grace doesn't cover your sin. Grace doesn't erase your sin. Grace is teaching you how to resist, turn from and walk away from anything that is not of God. It's teaching you how not to sin, not to cover your sin. Verse 15 and 16. Verse 15 and 16. What then shall we sin because we are not under law? We don't have a sin nature, but under grace we have God's nature. Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? To whom are you presenting yourself to? Paul says that whoever we decide to present or make ourselves available to will be our master, the soul and body of the uncorrupted human spirit. One leads to the lake of fire and eternal separation from God and the other to an eternity in God's presence. So why do Christians commit sins? They decide on purpose to make themselves available to sin. For example, through TV programs and movies that nurture sinful thoughts. They also have people in their lives that bring sin with them. What kind of sin? You have a friend who's living with his girlfriend. The Bible says two single people cannot have a husband and wife relationship. But you're okay making yourself available to sin by spending time with him like everything's okay. And it's not. He's in sin, and so are you if you don't distance yourself from him. I don't want you to miss what I'm about to say. If we continue to make ourselves available to sin, we can quench and grieve the Holy Spirit. This is what sin leading to death is talking about. I want you to let that sink in, ladies and gentlemen. 
the more sin we are around and allow to be present in our life, the more sin that will become normal for us. When sin becomes normal for us, we're no longer offended by it, nor will we feel the need to distance ourselves from it. We become accustomed to it and go back to our first nature, the nature of the dead man, the nature of the corpse, the nature that you should have crucified. Verses 17 through 23. But God, be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you present your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, you're still going to the bar. You're continuing to watch movies that nurture sinful thoughts. So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Stop going to the bar. Stop watching those movies. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now I've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. You have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For when you are a slave to sin, the wages of sin is death. But when you are a slave to righteousness, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Based on everything that I've shown you in this lesson, how important is grace? How important is grace? The wages of sin is death. Because our sin nature, our corrupted human spirit, through no fault of our own, we were headed for eternal damnation. But now the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. When we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, God's grace rescues us from the eternal death that waits everyone with a corrupted human spirit. We now have eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I know some people might struggle with the idea that they are sinning because they choose to. I know some people are going to message me and say, how can you say that I'm choosing to sin? I know that people will go and try to blast me because I say that sinning is a choice. But it isn't I that says it. It's the word of God that says it. It is a very comforting experiencing something that we can say is not our own fault. It's not my fault that I lied or stole. The devil made me do it because I'm just a sinner saved by grace. It's not my fault when I sin. I cannot help myself. This is how many Christians think. And in doing so, they forget what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. He wrote, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Paul wrote that God would ensure that we have all grace in order to do what? What did he say that we would have all grace? What what was all the grace for? All grace so that we will always have whatever we need in a given situation to handle our business. Or better said, to handle his business. You ain't here about your business. You better be about the father's business. If you claim to be a Christian and a disciple or an ambassador of Christ, you better be about his business and not your business. You see, grace is not covering anything. It's empowering. So we have what we need to resist sin and to walk away from it. God has empowered us, and for that reason alone, he can hold us accountable for how we choose to live. He can hold us accountable because he has given us everything we need to obey him. So in Romans chapter 6, we see that a Christian who sins does so on purpose. And it's not because of who he is. 
It's but it's because he refuses to follow the leading of his sinless human spirit. He chooses to give in to a rebellious, unsubmitted mind and a body that lusts after the flesh. And if he continues to do so, he is committing the most egregious act anyone can commit. He is backsliding from God and he doesn't even know it. I tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, if that's you, you need to fall on your knees right now and repent. It's not too late. Now that we have the context of Romans 1 through 6, we can examine Romans 7, and we're going to do that shortly. But I want you to understand that you have a choice here that has to be made, a choice that you have to choose, a choice. Because God made you perfect when you were reborn. He made you worth something when you were born again. The question is, are you choosing to follow your sinless nature? Or are you still choosing to follow your fallen nature?